Bob, with the great advent in brain research over the last uh, many decades, there's a lot of talk in society about how to improve your brains, most of which, at least to me, is just hokum, and uh, relieving people of their uh, hard-earned funds. Uh, you've taken a look at personal brain management from a serious, scientific, neuropsychiatric approach. Uh, I'd like to understand what a sane approach to personal brain management would be like. Yeah, yeah I think that you know, we've all had incredible enthusiasm stimulated by us learning enough about the brain with the hope that we can actually do something with this knowledge and help uh, ourselves to use our brains better. And indeed, you know, this is, in theory, the next stage of human evolution where we learn enough about our brains to be able to use them differently and thereby enhance our well-being. Uh, and now, unfortunately, as with any new technology, we've entered a, a serious snake oil phase um, where people recognizing the hopes and dreams of people will try to extract their money from them um, to sell brain training. I think I counted over a million websites now serving <laughs> oh, wow, right. brain training exercises right. of various kinds. Right, and using but, the, the words of neuroscience in their titles in some way or another, neuro something or That's other. right, neuro star. Yeah. Um, there's right. all kinds of neuro right. philosophy, right. neuro leadership, right. et cetera. Um, but I think we're um, entering a phase where some of these um, techniques are showing signs of significant change in the brain. Yeah, let's wipe so, out all the garbage and, and talk seriously about what can really work and some of the, the new thinking that you've been doing. Right, and so I think that what we're finding through um, uh, recent research is that very serious massed training can induce significant neuroplasticity in the brain. Um, and that means the brain can in fact change over time right. rather than just grow old and senile. <laughs> Guys like you and I have a chance. We do. I think, well, maybe, maybe we're deluding ourselves. But, um, but I really think that the uh, recent uh, studies are showing that if we do the right kinds of brain exercise and repeat it enough, that it actually can cause plastic changes in our brain. Uh, even the impact of aerobic exercise, mm -hmm. which I might have been very skeptical about just a few years ago, <clears throat> evidence has accumulated showing that these kinds of uh, interventions can effectively change certain aspects of our brain function. Mm. And now the serious research is really in an early stage, but I think we're really at a tipping point where these kinds of techniques are going to become widely used, okay, uh, including uh, neurofeedback techniques. Okay. So for example, I would certainly say a few years ago that, well, the evidence is really not that persuasive, that we can monitor, for example, our EEG or other uh, brain signals mm -hmm. and cause meaningful changes in our brain. But reducing I think that, stress or something. Reducing stress, yeah. Now, stress reduction is probably something that we can do relatively well even though we're here sitting in California where we can almost see Malibu out yeah. the window and there are alpha training centers and things like yeah. that. But I believe that uh, these kinds of relaxation exercises and a number of the techniques from positive psychology have already shown improvements in people's level of subjective and psychological well-being. And what we want to do here is try to understand, well, what are the brain mechanisms that mediate those? Mm -hmm. So just as there's been a positive psychology movement that's been spawned in the United States, which I believe has had some positive effects, it's also probably been oversold a bit. But I'd really like us to, uh, here at UCLA, um, be part of understanding the brain mechanisms behind these mm -hmm. and begin to use what we know about brain function uh, to uh, accelerate the development of techniques that can be used to help people do what they want to do. What, what are the categories uh, that, that you would say are serious and have either proven or promise to uh, help our own personal brain management. You, you mentioned physical exercise, aerobics, not just good for your heart, but actually good for your brain, increasing the mitochondria and the cells of the neurons or whatever the latest research is, but real, real data. So aerobics is one. Let's go That's through right. a, a list yeah. of things. So if we went beyond that, um, there's now a burgeoning literature in different kinds of brain training. The training of working memory functioning is something that's shown um, you know, significant gains. And one of the big bugaboos of this was, well, maybe you can do training and show that you can improve just in that particular function. Right. So the problem has no been a lack of generalization. Right. And some of the experiments are now showing a generalization. If you do a, a substantial and massed enough training of even a specific function like working memory, that it may have generalization so what's to other working, cognitive domains. What's a working memory uh, training system that might have this generalization? Yeah. So um, a training, for example, of uh, spatial locations. Um, uh, being able to maintain in mind, keep in mind, and then manipulate 
um, that uh, spatial representation in mind okay. so that it can then be retrieved at a subsequent point in time. Right. Um, or doing the same thing with uh, auditory linguistic stimuli, uh, being able to maintain a span of numbers or other words or other um, auditory representations right. over time. Um, these kinds of things are showing uh, the capacity to change the fundamental way we, uh, we perceive other stimuli. Now, I've been trying to learn serious uh, table tennis for the last year. Well, and uh, do you think that's going to help my brain? Um, I think that that may be um, something that will help you play better table tennis. <laughs> um, and there, um, a lot of motor learning and motor sequencing um, can um, be learned. It probably is changing neurons in your frontostriatal circuits <laughs> and a certain subset of circuits. But I'd be surprised if that's going to generalize a lot to uh, um, your ability to solve crossword puzzles, for example. Um, but All I right. think that some of these other things might. So, so what are the other categories? I think something that's really at an early stage, but I think has enormous uh, promise, is learning how we can use our brains to better regulate our visceral and autonomic nervous system. Mm. And it's really incredible that uh, cognitive neuroscience has focused so much on the control of motor actions in the dorsal parts of our brains. But the whole ventral parts of our brains and the paths from our frontal lobes into our hypothalamus and other limbic structures has been more ignored. And I think this is a huge thing. So the processes of um, meditation, uh, like mindfulness-based uh, relaxation therapies mm -hmm. and mindfulness-based stress reduction, I think we're going to soon begin to understand what are the brain changes that are accomplished by people who are serious practitioners uh, and how do they accomplish the gains that they do accomplish in stress reduction um, and overall senses of well-being. Mm. And I think this kind of uh, uh, increased appreciation of how we can control our internal environment is going to be fostered also by the ability to use sensors. Because right now, we can have, I have an iPhone app that will monitor my heart rate variability by letting me put my fingertip in front of the camera. Mm. Um, and as we begin to accumulate information like this using uh, biosensors, monitor it and find the links among these things, it's gonna enable us to gain insights into the things that are stressing us out and how we can better manage stressors in our environment. And soon we're gonna be accumulating so much information about ourselves and using that to build models of ourselves that we can then look at um, and begin to use analytic tools upon um, to understand ourselves more deeply. And I think by understanding ourselves more deeply, it's going to generate an opportunity for us to make interventions that we understand.